Today, you're in the class about PM versus PO, what, who does what. If you're looking for something on roadmap, you're in the wrong place. All right? All right, so let's get started. Brief, you, those of you who are this morning already saw this slide about the 280 group. We're just soup to nuts about product management. Okay, So I'm not going to give a long dissertation on all the things we do. You hopefully got our, our understanding this morning when you were here at the opening session. If not, come and chat with me afterwards. I can fill you in. I will give you this one little bit of interesting advice because it's also kind of a brand exercise. Why are we called the 280 group? Some people are like, oh, isn't it the 180 group? I'm like, no, because then you'd just be going backwards. That would be kind of boring. Right? But it's named after a freeway. Okay? So Brian Lawley, who founded 280 Group nearly 20 years ago, we celebrate our 20th anniversary this summer, um, thought of 280 as the spine of innovation between San Francisco and San Jose. And he wasn't really kind of thinking that someday we'd be teaching classes in London and Dubai and, and uh, Luxembourg all over the world. And so kind of a branding lesson, probably think bigger when you're branding your company. Because now we always have to explain to people, well, it's, it's a freeway in Silicon Valley that we named our company Yeah, because otherwise you'd be the 17 Hamilton group. Well, something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so a little bit about me. Why should you care? I've been in product management a really long time. After 20 years, I just put a plus sign because I just don't want to admit how long I've been actually doing this. Um, I did start in a technical degree. I was a developer once upon a time, got my EECS from Cal, and then I came here to Santa Clara University, although some of you heard not this building, it didn't exist yet, and got my MBA so that I could speak the language that a product manager needs to speak across all the different disciplines, right? Because when you start doing product management, you've got to be having a wider filter, wider set of vocabulary so that you're able to talk with the finance folks and the marketing folks, as well as the development team, obviously, right? And this talk is going to be focused on that relationship. I have various certifications. And the last thing I emphasize is giving back. It's something that is talked about at Product Camp a lot because we're here to give back. I also believe in the value of giving back, so I serve on three different boards, including our school board in my local school district, where Tim ha actually happens to live. Okay, So give back. Try to help other people as you're moving around. All right, so today's topic, what's the difference between a product manager and a product owner? And how do you actually create an awesome relationship between the two roles? So I want to pause here and ask, who's a product manager? Raise your hand. Okay, so two product managers. Who's a product owner? Raise your hand. Okay, so you're in the dual role, all right? We will talk about that. And you're a product owner, sort of? Yeah. Okay, scrum masters? Yeah. Okay, you're a scrum, master, scrum master? Okay, all right. And then for those of you who've chosen not to vote, well, tell me what you're doing. All of the above. All of the above. And Awesome. Small teams. <laughs> right. Right. How big is your company? Uh, 70 people. Our team is oh, three people. Okay. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. So it's like three developers or? One developer, one UX designer. And you? Okay. So you've got the PO, PM, and you are using Agile methodology. Uh, Ish. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Air quotes. Adding, add, add, yeah. adding process. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. How about over here? I do product strategy for Semantic. Okay. For the unit. So you're the strategy group. Great. And you? I'm an Agile. Agile coach, fantastic. And you're product marketing, product marketing, right? right? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Everybody's got to figure out how to sell it. That's right, eventually. <laughs> yes. And we'll talk about that actually because we're going to use positioning statements as the framework for this. Okay. So, what's this all about, these different roles? Okay. So, we use the bowl of fruit as an analogy here because some people are asking kind of the wrong question. Product manager, product owner, you're not comparing apples to apples here. You're comparing a bowl of fruit, product management, to an apple product owner. There's a difference in scope of responsibility here between product managers and product owners. Also, we don't want to talk about titles. I want to talk about roles. Who's doing what? The actual effectiveness of what you're doing every day is what matters here, not so much the title. So you're a product manager and a product owner, but what's your actual title? Product manager. Product manager, okay, but he's got multiple roles, right? So we're going to talk about the roles. And again, I'm not going to be pedantic about, well, if that's your title, then that's what you should do. you got to think about, well, is everything that needs to get done being covered? And do we have the right people so that there isn't a gap, as well as there's not too much overlap? You don't want to be stepping on each other's toes, but you also want to make sure there's not some pieces that are falling on the floor. All right? So that's what we're talking about. So product management. There are, there's a broad scope for product management, and I have a visual for this in a moment. I'm also not in the business of like reading all the text on slides, okay? 
So I'm just going to pause for a moment, let you look at the slide and say, okay, does this feel like what you think a product manager should do? Can you do that for a second? I'm sorry. Yeah, you will. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is there anything on here that rubs you the wrong way? Anything on here that you feel like, well, oh, really? I didn't think a product manager did that. Is there some stuff you're doing as a product manager that's not on here? Anybody? Supply <laughs> chain seems like a different uh, kettle of fish. Well, so. In a different class, we talk about the fact that whole product is a product manager's responsibility. That's important to be looking at. In fact, it was mentioned in the keynote this morning, right? Whole product perspective. That doesn't mean that, like you were talking supply chain, that doesn't mean you're responsible for managing these relationships, but you're responsible for making sure that the right value is being delivered. So you're responsible for making sure that you have the right supplier if you're outsourcing a piece of the puzzle, okay? That's what we're talking about here. So the product manager has that large picture vision of what the value is that we should be delivering, and then has a whole team of other folks to help. Does that help answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, great question. Yeah, so the presents needs, not the problem solver, does not design features. That one, to some extent, you know, doesn't fully resonate. I mean, yep. there is a bit of uh, that that I can see in that. Yeah, this is a very big source of conversation when I'm teaching any class on product management is that product managers, particularly ones like myself, who used to be technical, want to and end up defining features. And what we try to espouse is you move more into talking about benefits, talking about customer needs, not talking about features. And there's kind of two forces involved here. Sometimes the engineering team is like, hey, I need more specificity. And if you're particularly in a B2B, where you're dealing with a very technical product, sometimes that can be legit, okay? And you have to tune your, your relationship to how good is that engineering team, right? Because maybe they just don't yet have the expertise to know what features need to be done to deliver that benefit or need that the product manager should be bringing to the table. So there's some flex here, okay? And we'll talk more about that on another slide. But here's the thing about product managers. If you're not understanding the customer's problem and you're not identifying the customer's needs, Nobody else is, all right? So that's what you've got to be sure you're covering that part, all right? Because nobody else is doing that. You can say, well, sales knows, or maybe customer support knows, and they are two great sources of that information, but sales is always gonna be driven by whatever deal's in front of them, and customer support's always gonna be driven about the particular pain point that's bugging them, and not having the whole picture of what all those needs are. That's where product management has those relationships with sales, has a relationship with customers, gets that information, stirs it all together, and identifies here are the real critical needs we've got to solve. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, I think that's the only other clarification I have is around the not the problem solver. It's kind of open-ended, right? Well, okay, fair enough. So you should be presenting needs and then not coming up with a solution, right? That's what I say, not problem solver. Yeah, you're solving all kinds of problems as a product manager. Right? But I don't want you to be coming up with, well, I want blue buttons over on the right. Right? You want the UX person on your team to be handling that. I've designed a user experience before. It sucked. Okay? So that's a bad thing. Don't do that again. I, I will never do it again. Don't do that. If you can get UX expertise, even on a team as small as yours, you already have a UX person. That's awesome. Okay? Very cool. Anything else on here that you have questions about? Because, yeah. So under strategy, you talk about portfolio management, mm -hmm. and I would say depending on the size of the organization, if it's a yes. decent size, you might manage your slice of the portfolio. Piece. Right, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Portfolio management, again, flexes depending on the size of the company. You're probably having to do a little bit of that. But hopefully there's someone above you that has the larger picture of the portfolio management, right? Kind of more for a leader of product management. But I will give you one anecdote. When I was managing one business, having an understanding of how the other businesses around me were operating was valuable. And knowing what my place was for my product in the ecosystem. So there's some understanding of where, what role you play. Does that make sense? <laughs> Answer your question? Great. Any other questions about this? All right, so that's product management. And then product ownership is more specific, right? It's all of this stuff. So notice the top. Product management can be and should be any of these. 
Whereas product ownership is all of these, right? So maximizing value of the product and the work of the development team. In the Agile Manifesto, and you're, you're scrum trained, maybe you know the phrase, right? What is, what is the ultimate goal? Deliver what? Working software. Deliver working software is one of the underlying tenets, but delivering business value is the overall tenet, right? And the product owner, day in, day out, is the one most responsible for that. Product manager, figure scope. The product owner, day in, day out, making sure that they're working on the most valuable thing next, right? And then they're the one who has ownership of the product backlog, all right? And that's a key distinction, a key ownership point for a product owner with all of these sub-pieces. Again, I'm not going to read all the slide text to you. We'll take a look at it and see if you have any questions about that. Again, value comes up a couple times here, right? Does anybody have any questions about this? So personally, I like this next slide more. I'm more a visual person, all right? So I like this slide because it shows that there is a by design overlap between the product manager and the product owner. And there are areas of responsibility that are solely the product managers and areas of responsibility that are solely the product owners. But there's a big overlap, right? You meet on making sure that the vision and the roadmap are aligned. You meet on understanding who are we delivering to. If you're not familiar with the term personas, we're talking about all of the people that participate in this value chain. Because there's a buyer especially in B2B, a lot of folks will say, oh, I didn't ask that question. How many people are in B2B? Oh, how many are B2Z? Okay. And most of you haven't raised your hands yet, so B2B2Z or B2G? Is this the government? All right, I'm missing. So what are you, what are you folks, what are you guys in that are not? I'm a consultant. It changes every three okay. years. Okay, all right, fair enough. <laughs> um, it's really more internal product. Than so you're like an IT kind of department. Okay, so in a way, that's a B2B. Right? Yeah. How about you? What was, what was the second one you said? B to B, business yeah. to business. B to C, business to consumer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Consumer? Okay. All right. So personas, E, e B to C, or B to B, are all about making sure you understand all the participants in the value chain, right? And even in B to C, there, there are multiple personas. People don't realize this. My, my, my favorite example of that is the Christmas present, right? So you have the end user who is like the eight year old child. Okay, that's one persona. You have the parents, is another persona. And then you have the grandparents who are the, the buyer persona. And if you're trying to sell a toy, right, you need to appeal to all of them, right, to get that toy purchased. The user, of course, wants to want it, right? And the grandparent feels like that's gonna be a good buy, and then the parent agrees, yeah, I'm okay with that. So I have four kids, and one time an aunt wanted to buy a drum set, okay? <laughs> And the kids were fine with that, and the aunt was fine with that, but I had veto power as the parent, right? No, I'm not doing that. Okay, so you see how personas work, right? Even in B2C, there are personas. What's that? Yeah, symbol. Symbol, oh man, yeah. We, we, we nixed that purchase, okay? So for, for that, correct? Yes? What if you're missing one? Like what if you don't have a product manager or a product owner? What if you only have one? What, well, what goes away? Uh, that's the thing, right? The issue isn't so much what goes away as what doesn't get done as well, right? Because all of these things are going to probably have to get done to a greater or lesser extent. And I have another slide that actually addresses that. Unfortunately, the common thing to find is that this stuff, particularly the top one, voice of the customer, and competitive analysis and market research are the ones that are the, the ones that get sacrificed. Because yeah. the product owner has to feed the beast every day, right? So there, you know, you live in this, right? Yep. So your stuck in the tactical aspects of product ownership and not getting enough time for the strategic aspects of product management. You're also losing. I'm, it's true. You're living this, right? Okay. So when you get these slides, you can use these slides to have a conversation with your manager about how are we going to make sure we do these things? The voice of the customer, the portfolio, understanding who we are selling to with segmentation, and the competitive analysis, the other four Ps, right? Pricing promotion in place, in addition to the key P that we've spent many times building the slide, which is product, right? Okay? So, did that answer your question? It's unfortunately, that's the victim over there. 
all right, of, of being both roles. Now, there are times, though, like in an IT shop, actually, where the role can be combined fine. Your level of scope is enough that you can handle it all. All right? And I actually have a couple of slides to talk about that. So it's not always necessary to have the role split. But if you're talking about something that has end users and a large market, not having those roles split is going to be probably pretty painful, unfortunately. Or pieces of the job aren't getting done right. Okay? That's what I'm saying. This hopefully can be a good set of slides for you to have that conversation. How do we get better focused on strategy, for example? All right? Questions about this overlap? Because this is kind of like the key fulcrum of the whole discussion today. Everybody get this split of responsibilities? Okay. So the thing that I like to focus on here in this center part is the fact that the product manager and the product owner have to come together on this vision, on what we want for the future. And in fact, at the next uh, session, I'll be, I'll be doing a, a session on writing a product vision. Right? So if you're more interested in that, you can go to the next session and talk about that. But you've got to get alignment on vision. The other thing, too, is how many of you are in remote teams? How many of you have remote teams going on? Okay? I've done remote teams in China, Ukraine, India, and one of the key things that I found missing is if you've only got a scrum master over in that remote area and no product owner over there, that's a recipe for disaster. So the more you can get a product owner to be part of the remote team, because then if you two are, are having the good relationship here in the middle and really aligned on what the vision is, what the needs are that we need to, to be meeting, then when you're asleep and the team's working, the product owner is able to answer those questions. The scrum masters often try to do that, but it's not their full-time job, and so that gets lost. So I've had this before. I even had somebody where we had a representative of the offshore in, in our office, supposedly to be our advocate for making sure all the right things happen. But in this case, he was with me. And so he was also trying to sleep when the team was actually doing their work. So that model didn't work either. So the best practice for remote teams is get a product owner over in co-located with the team. Because the product owner is a part of the scrum team. Right, in Scrum methodology, product owner is a member of that team. They should be part of the development team. Does that make sense? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, do you have any suggestion on how to staff that position in a remote location with somebody who's going to be capable of doing a good job? It's a good question. So what I have found is if you aren't finding anybody who's, who's in that, that remote team that's doing this, bring them over for a month and have them co-locate with the product manager, and they're going to get a crash course on some of the pieces that they need to be responsible for, right? Because that, and then they also build a relationship, right? The other best practice is the product manager goes over there and spends at least a couple of weeks a year with the development team, becoming a personality, a person that you can relate to, a person that you want to have a relationship with, right? So, for example, when I was working with China teams, every time I would go, I would bring a big bag of Ghirardelli chocolates with me because I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. It says San Francisco right on it. Right? And they would love that I would bring some chocolates over. And I would go out for a hot pot with them after work, even though I was jet lagged. Right? And spend time getting to know them as people and having them get to know me as a person. So that builds a much more powerful relationship between the product manager and the rest of the team, and in particular, the product owner. Going back three slides and then repeating on this slide, I think, especially in your case, but just in general, it really helps that the voice of the owner is shared, uh, mm -hmm. the voice of the customer is shared. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, I'm sometimes stuck on the PM being the voice of the customer. I'd rather it was the designer, the research team, or the product owner. Oh, interesting. So you have so, it on the left-hand side, which I don't think is right. Well, so I have voice of the customer here, yeah. but we also have this as a shared responsibility as the customer advocate in development. So let me explain the difference, yeah. okay. okay? So, because I'm, I'm being pretty precise here. Voice of the customer is about voice of the customer research. Getting out of the building, and going and doing actual interviews with customers, focus groups with customers, spending time, day in the life of a customer, those three things I would not expect a product owner to do. If they can get brought out occasionally and participate, that would be awesome. But oftentimes, again, their role is going to be close to the development team most of the time. Right? Now, if maybe you've got a design sprint or something where then they could get away for a little while, that would be fantastic. Okay? So I'm talking about specific research techniques when I say voice of the customer. But that's why it does say the shared responsibility is they are both the customer advocates in the development team. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So to add to that, yeah. I would say in having seen some scrum oriented presentations where they don't label a specific product manager role, so to say, mm -hmm. they're often, their definitions of product owner are really, you're the one, voice of the customer, you're out with the customer, et cetera, because they have basically axed PM out of sure. the way they're stating reality. But, you know, <laughs> we all have our own lens. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, and in your case, you talk, I mean, really, you're talking about the same thing. It's a product manager and product owner. Get back to the titles versus roles. Thing. Right, right. So it's, they're, it's they're a combined role the functionality together at that point. Yeah, it's a combined role, but with the whole slide of responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. I think what I hear you say. So that, that's just the same challenge as if you were the product manager title, but you have the role of both product manager and product owner. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Okay. So good question. Right, I'm talking about specific techniques here. But yes, they are both responsible for advocating for the customer. And the product owner on the ground every day, product manager writ large for the whole product solution. Okay? Making sure again. I think that's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. it is. And, and, and as that voice of the customer outside, as well as with marketing and customer support and sales, all right? So that they are expressing everything in terms of benefits, okay? Tim did a talk this morning, maybe some of you saw it, uh, about the, the customer journey, right? Of uh, making sure that everybody gets what are we really doing to the customer? How are we making, in, in, in their language, the customer the hero of the story, right? This is a just comment. One of the audience came up afterwards. He's an engineer. And uh, one of the things I told him is if you don't understand the problem that you're solving for your customer, you're not going to write the right code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your, your engineering team has to understand whether you can get them out and actually talking to customers is immaterial, but right. if if they don't understand what they're fixing, how do you know they're going to fix it? Right. Just fixing like, or solving or helping, because I also get into this problem language, but also like if you're writing games, it's not problem solving as much as it's entertainment, right? Yeah. You're delivering value. Yeah, right? absolutely. Delivering if, value. If you don't know what a, how a candle is used, how can you make a candlestick? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Right, absolutely. What's the point? Yeah, good, good point. Anything else on here that people are curious about? Makes sense. So yeah, all of these things have to get done. Well, it doesn't matter what particular title you hold. You have to make sure that the, the role is being fulfilled. Do any of these, do the product owner stuff exist outside of Scrum? Because I mean, they, this seems very Scrum focused. It is Scrum focused because that definition comes from the Scrum process, right? So, or the Scrum methodology. In, I don't know, and maybe you know better than I do, in Kanban, whether or not they have a product owner defined role. So there's no named role, but yeah. obviously that needs to be done. Right, okay. So again, I'm leveraging the fact that, you know, the Scrum methodology specifically calls out the role. Hmm. But yes, but again, roles versus titles, the job's gotta get done. Right? So you want to make sure that in any development team, someone is responsible for making sure we're delivering business value. I, I'm involved in, in lots of products, projects that we're coming in from the outside on it as a consultant. Uh, it, it's, it's necessarily you know, somewhat waterfall driven. You know, mm -hmm. the, we, there, it, there's very little you know, grooming of features. It's just you know, when they're going to get built, sure. not if they're going to get built. Okay. So, so a, a lot of the Scrum stuff doesn't Cleanly. I mean, I, I, I try to keep it as agile as I can. Right. There's limitations. Well, of course, when you're in an environment like maybe when there's hardware involved, right, then you can't use all the agile methodology. There's a lot of goodness to come from that perspective, certainly. And again, delivering business value, that absolutely is something that you want to make sure you're doing waterfall or agile. It doesn't matter, right? It's more convincing the customer than any like specific you know, technical reason why it can't be done that way. It's, it's software, everything. Okay. Like Convincing your customer, yeah. right? Not, yeah, good, good. All right, let's keep going. So delivering desirable and profitable products to market. That's another way of you know, delivering business value is the ultimate goal here in this relationship between product management and the product owner, all right? So all of this is about well, achieve product market fit. And I've heard that phrase in almost every talk I've been in this morning. So I want to harp on it, but I will pause and say, does anybody not understand what I mean when I say achieve product market fit? 
Anyone? Everybody get it, right? Product market fit, right? I'm sorry, say again? <laughs> you just need a bigger hammer, right? I guess I will say one thing because it didn't seem to come out explicitly in the other talk I was in. There are kind of three points to this triangle, all right? When you talk about this, and sometimes this is called the PM triple point, and the first one is this problem, and the second one is the solution, and the third piece is marketing and business model. So that fit has to take all three of these perspectives into account. All right? We talk about this in one of my other classes, but people lose sight of one or maybe even two of these, especially in Silicon Valley, where you know, it's the if, they, if we build it, they will come perspective. You get over-focused on that point of the triangle, right? If you're not getting good voice of the customer research done, then maybe you don't understand this very well. But some companies now, I've been doing this for a long time, some people do get these two pieces, but then they forget this piece. Remember the early 2000s? Okay, where a whole bunch of stuff was trying to be done and nobody was worried about actually making money. And it's all the eyeballs. Right? Remember those days? Home and that's when this point of the triangle was forgotten. What? No, homegrocer.com. Oh, yeah, pets.com. Yeah, Peapod. Right? Nobody had the business model aspect. So don't forget that part in the product manager. Right? This is more a product manager thing. Right? But making sure, yeah, can we do this and achieve our goals? And even nonprofit organizations, by the way, need to be worried about the business model. So people are like, yeah, but I'm not commercial. Yeah, you still have to keep the lights on, right? So maybe it's in partnerships, maybe it's in funding, maybe it's getting grant proposals approved. Whatever it might be, you still have to have a business model. Okay? So don't overlook that piece. Does that help? Okay, because sometimes people don't cover that. All right, so there's two sides to achieving this fit. There's the product, and then there's the business. And you'll notice we've got the three P's and then the services over on, on that side. And then of course the fourth P product is over on the left, right? Back to the earlier question about features, right? So I, I want the product manager to be solving problems, to be a problem solver over here. And the product owner should be the problem solver over here. And then they've got to work really well together to make sure that they've got the whole piece taken a look at. Everybody gets that vision. Does this make sense? <coughs> so especially for you in a dual role, dual role, you have to look at this whole slide, right? And carve out enough time to spend time over on this right-hand side. Questions about that? You guys have a little lunch dole for this thing going on here? <laughs> no, this is great. So my, just so you know, my second PM shows up on Monday. So this is the perfect slide for me. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Glad to hear it. That's fantastic. All right, so how do you flip the switch? How do we make this happen, all right? Well, oh, I, I, I already buried the lead, so here it is. <laughs> PO equals product, PM equals product and business. More of a focus on the business side, but still the whole bigger picture, right? And making sure that the product will deliver those benefits, right? So the product manager is the first customer, the first one to make sure that the features that are being proposed will solve the problems, right? So that's important too. So for those of you in dual roles again, and even if you're a product owner, you want you gotta push on the product manager a little bit. Hey, are we building the right thing? Is this really gonna solve the problem that we say we want to solve for our customers? Okay. I've worked with a lot of development teams. I work with development teams who are so pushy that are like they always think they know better. I've also worked with development teams who are like, just tell me what to do and I'll go do it. And neither is actually right. Okay? You kind of want something in the middle where they're gonna be skeptical. Right? They're going to ask questions. They want to make sure that you got it. Right? You know the who. You know the why. You know the what of this product. All right? But you also want them then once you've done your market research and your customer research and you've understood your competitive situation to trust that you've done your homework and then collaborate with you on building the right set of features. So it's a balancing act also. Anybody have this kind of relationship challenge with your development team? Either they think better than you do about what to solve, or they're just kind of like, I'll just do whatever you tell me to do, and I'll go do it. A little bit of both? Okay. Yep. Yep. How about over here? You're, you're a small enough team that you all are oh, simpatico, right? You're all like the breed? Okay. Awesome. Wait one until it gets bigger. One <laughs> of the things I've experienced is, is the, I'm too damn busy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, they've got their they've got their list of things they're doing, and they don't want any more input. And you're talking about on the dev side? Yeah, dev yeah. 15. Mm -hmm. Sure. So how do you solve that problem? You try to be a little more prescriptive, probably, in that case, giving them the information they need to be successful. Okay? Ideally, you get this relationship going where you present needs and problems, they present ideas to solve before code gets written. Right? And then you work together like, okay, yeah, those seem like good, those are going to be the right features to actually help solve the business problem. And then you've gotten that first thing out of, out of the way. Even better is when you can do what I call like a prototype or a mock-up and actually go out and test it before the code gets written and make sure, yes, that's actually what I, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, really want solved. That's even better, right? And if we have time, and I think we're, we're running at a good pace, I'll give some examples of how to go about doing prototypes. All right? Yeah. Can I just send you back to the, the Too Busy Dev team? That shows that you have an opportunity to show empathy by killing stuff. Fair enough, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And that's another conversation, but then we're talking about the minimum viable product, right? Okay. Or the minimum viable whole product, as Michael was talking about in this morning's talk, right? Okay. Good. All right, so how do you know when you're being successful? As a product manager, it's all about making sure that the business case is actually realized. And what does that mean? It means that, yes, we're solving the problem well. Yes, we have a good solution to solve that problem. It's somehow differentiated from everything else going on out there in the marketplace. Lots of competition out there. And yes, it's delivering on our business metrics. All, right? All three of those pieces need to be involved in this business case realization. For product owner, you know you've got a successful product owner when they're building the right product. Right? And they are using metrics of success that are specific to the product owner in terms of are we hitting the velocity goals that we have? Are we being able to keep the product backlog properly groomed? Are we being able to deliver on the estimates that we made? Right? So those, and you give even more examples, I'm sure, but a product owner should have those product-driven metrics as their means of understanding whether they're doing a great job or not. Okay? Does that make sense? Questions about that? Try to keep it high level. There's a lot more detail underneath, but this is, this is a good high level understanding. So let's talk about a little bit of where you fit in, because there are circumstances where you have a shared <coughs> responsibility, and that makes sense, all right? So a good mindset to use when you're trying to figure out, am I more a product manager or more a product owner, is this perspective of, if you give me this money, I will deliver you this business result. That's the product manager's perspective, all right? They're trying to prove the case, the bigger picture. Again, all three points of the triangle. The product owner, Hey, we're going to spend this money. I better make sure we get the most out of it. All right? Different perspective. You see the difference? Okay? Product manager's got this bigger picture to solve of like, oh, we got to go get a real business result done. Product owner's like, okay, the business result's been chosen. We're going to go get this business result. Now, it's my responsibility to make sure we do the best job delivering on that. Use our engineering development resources in the best possible way to get this business result. <coughs> So is the fundamental differentiator P&L responsibility? Not necessarily, because there's a lot of product managers who don't have P&L responsibility. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. There's, I mean, I've led product management teams where we had P&L, and I've led product management teams where we don't. The argument for the P&L responsibility breaks down to, uh, it's better when the product manager has it. The challenge is then the metric for success for a product manager, some of those pieces are so out of their control that then they really can never be fully <coughs> judged against it. Yeah, they don't have control over the sales team. I was from, team. from the previous screen. Nobody ever asked me about pricing. Really? Yeah. Wow. What do you mean? Nobody ever asked you about pricing? You mean from a product manager? Yeah. Well, just just with with the pieces that uh, I, I guess I'm more of a product owner than mm. uh, out of those pieces. Like, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to gauge like to become a full fledged product manager is, is pricing the thing that Absolutely. I need to add to the it, it's, it's an essential part. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's an essential part. The pricing is the lever that you can use to maximize, hopefully, your business goals based on the value that you're delivering. Right? So absolutely, a product manager should own that. Okay? The product owner would not. Yeah. With that, you can get your talks where the premise was, don't think product market fit, but think product market price fit, because it's, mm. are you having the right product at the right price point to solve your problems? You know, and, and if you aren't thinking of pricing way up front and evaluating whether the price points meet the customer needs way early, 
you may have built the product you wanted, but it's not sellable. And nobody will pay for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that all fits into this bucket in terms of the business model. Have I uncovered value that people are willing to pay for? Right? Willingness to pay, that's the frequent expression of that. And that's, again, more voice of the customer research. You go out and do things like what we call conjoint analysis, where you actually force the customer to trade off different benefits versus others, and that's how you can gauge whether or not they're willing to pay for the value you're going to deliver. Very important approach. And again, a product manager role, not a product owner role. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of a lot of my friends that, that are product managers mm -hmm. are, are you know, big companies where there's these, these huge products, and, and the, the product they're responsible for doesn't have an individual price. It's part of a whole suite of things. Sure, and so, sure. So that's where it comes back into knowing the role your product plays in the portfolio, yeah. right? Because some products are giveaways, right? Other products can be a loss leader to bring, you know, in using the old brick and mortar model, bringing people into the store to buy the other stuff that you get good margins on, right? The printer and the ink, right? Printers are sold on awfully thin margins, but the ink you make a lot of money on, right? So if, if you're being measured that way, you want to make sure the portfolio is being measured for success. And, or that your piece is being measured against a goal that makes sense for you. Okay, I'm only going to make a 2% margin, but that's okay, because I'm enabling a business that overall makes a 50% margin when you take into account the full value that we're selling. So Does that make sense? So yeah, so that's where this P&L responsibility mm -hmm. can vary for a product manager, but somewhere in the big portfolio, somebody should have that responsibility. Sure. But, but I mean, someone like, like a, in a you know, tech company with, with a zillion product managers, mm -hmm. LinkedIn or Google or Facebook or something like, like that. You know, they, the money's only coming in in terms of advertising that's like three levels removed from the individual product features that you're putting in. They, that's meant to satisfy customer needs, but there, there's no money changing hands among anybody you know. <laughs> right. I mean, that, that's, that's over in some other building. Mm -hmm. Well, and so what I'm saying is a product manager needs to get a broader perspective than that so that they do, can connect the dots between the advertising revenue, in your, in your example, and the value they're delivering. Right. Will the value I'm delivering actually lead to more advertising revenue? Right. And people often just throw their hands up and say, eh, I don't have to know that. And I'd say, eh, bad answer. Right. You actually should go out and do voice of the customer research and get out of the building and go, go connect those dots. So say, even, even if you don't, even if your managers aren't, you should keep your eye on that in order to yes. Because at some point, if you're not delivering value, then you get into this just, I'm just building more features because I can, right? Instead of a good prioritization of, if I deliver this benefit versus this benefit, which one's going to give more, in your case, ad revenue? And you've got to be able to figure that out. In this day and age, we have so many more metrics now, you should be able to figure that out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and you're right, this happens all the time. Right? When I was part of a big company, I worked for Microsoft for two years. I could see it happen all the time. I'm like, oh, really? You just you don't really have any responsibility. You just keep presenting more features to throw on the roadmap, and people happily just take them. Well, that's kind of a sweet deal until you lose your job because somebody finally realizes there's no real value being delivered here. We just have a scrum team or a, you know, pod one, pod two, that they're, they've been here forever, and we should just keep feeding them more things to do. Right? Get out of that mentality because it doesn't end well. At some point, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tim. So back on the pricing and, and relationship, this one thing to keep in mind is what's the, what's the bigger picture? Because one of the things that we discovered at our company was it costs a dollar ten to make a dollar in revenue for the first sale. Mm -hmm. Sure. What do you think? How the hell do you make any money? Yeah. Well, you make money because in thirty to ninety days, they're buying another. 40 cents. Okay, there you go. That only and opened another, costs and less than 30 cents. And the costs drop. Mm -hmm. Because right. they say, okay, it works here. Well, these guys need to use it, so let's, let's expand. Right. Either vertically or horizontally. Mm -hmm. So yes. you know, don't, don't get wrapped around the axle about direct profit and loss for a transaction. So what, what Tim is talking about is longitudinal, right? So over time, it can be acceptable in a short period of time to be upside down. As long as your business model can show you that longer term, you can get to being in the black, right? But it could, it shouldn't be that long. Depends on what your 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 return on investment time frame can be, right? If you have patience for that, great. If you don't, then maybe not. So you still have to have that that conversation. Good good point. 
Any other questions about this? Does mindset make sense? Anybody get that? All right. So I've already kind of talked a little bit about this. A product manager in particular is going to have both a business focus and a technology focus. When you have a great partnership, a product owner can help <coughs> over on the technology focus side, right? They can take their eyes off the development team because they trust their product owner is making sure that every day you're delivering business value. And that then en enables them, frees them to do these things. Become the market expert. Do that voice of the customer research and understand your competition, all right? Because those three things, if you're not doing them, nobody else is. So for those of you in dual roles, be, be sure you know who is doing these things. Maybe it's not you, maybe it's a business analyst, maybe it is your portfolio manager above you, but make sure someone is doing that work. Right, and that's where you can get dangers in startup companies when you have very technology-focused C-level mm -hmm. people. Because right. they're so into the technology and features that they're not they're not in the blue zone there. Mm -hmm. Right, and again, I kind of hinted at this earlier, but coming from a technical background as a product manager, there can be this tendency to end up a little bit too far over on this side, on the technology focus side. And like I said earlier, if no, nobody else is doing that job on the right, so you better try to be pushing yourself that way. And sometimes it also isn't just because of the development team's maturity, it's because of your own comfort zone. If you started out life as an engineer, you just kind of find yourself wandering, i get the right direction, wandering over here by accident. Right? Because that's your comfort zone. That's what you grew up with, if you will. Right? And all of a sudden, you find yourself down here like, whoa, what am I doing over here? Right? And the engineers, especially a good engineering team, would be kind of like, get out of here. I know what I'm doing here. Let me innovate. Let me come up with the way the feature should be developed. Go do your job because nobody else is doing it. Right? So try to catch yourself. If you're a product manager with a technical background and you find yourself, I just read about this new API and I think we should be using it. Whoa, time out, you're out of bounds there. Unless your customer research says all your customers need that API and they're telling you that, okay? So you can see sometimes, especially in B2B, in a very technology focused or technical sales focused business, sometimes you do specify pretty technically specific things. But if you did it because the market research and the competitive research and the voice of the customer research led you to that outcome, fine. If you're doing it because you used to be an engineer and you think it's cool, stop that. Bad, bad product manager. Okay? Make sense? The difference? Right? So there are times, especially B2B, very, very technical products, that you will specify technical things. But you should be doing it on the basis of the market research. All right? And then and you should show that to the engineering team, because they may say, hey, I want to do this API. Why are we doing that API? Well, eight out of ten customers surveyed said that's the API that they need to integrate to. Does that apply to TPMs too? Mm -hmm. How do you mean it applies to TPMs, technical product managers? Well, right? I'm more asking you. Like, like I, I know that. I don't understand the question though, so tell me what you mean. Uh, it seems like technical product managers would, would be, that would be part of their mission to, to stay neck deep in the, in the technical way. Technical product managers, which is an older term now that kind of the product owner and <coughs> the agile methodology oh. supplants. Okay. The technical product manager kind of plays the product owner role. So yes, in that case, they are looking for the features. They are looking for the technologies to present back to the product manager and say, we think these technologies will help solve the problem, the need that you presented to us, Mr. or Mrs. Product Manager. Does that make sense? TPMs and product owners are kind of synonymous? They, they are, I think. because I had TPMs 15 years ago, and I haven't heard that term as much more recently. More and more product owner. Right? If you have a large enough company where, and you're doing waterfall, then yes, you have a product manager and a technical product manager, and the technical product manager is playing this PO role as defined in the agile methodology. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, if, at Microsoft, they would have called them program managers, right? Or, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Product planner and, pro and, and program manager. They actually <coughs> didn't have product manager, although they did, but it was really a product marketing role. The product managers at Microsoft, at least when I was there, and that was a while ago now, product managers were really product marketing managers, and product technical and product planners were a piece of the product management function, and the program managers had a lot of technology and product management. Yeah, it was an odd model in my mind. Sorry? It's not at all confusing. 
No, 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 at all. That's right. Can I answer your question? Yes, if you have technical product managers, then yes, they are going to be looking for the best technology to help solve the problem. But again, they should still come out from a business value perspective, not shiny new object, right? Or look at that puppy, right? Whatever might be distracting people. And unfortunately, C level folks do that all the time, too. They go read an article or they see something and they go, oh, that's, that's cool, we should be doing that. Well, why should we be doing that? Put on your PM hat and go make sure, right? So the antidote for that one, by the way, because people bring that up all the time. Well, but my VP told me I had to, okay? Go do some research. Prove to yourself whether or not that really is a good idea or not. And then politely and respectfully go back to that VP and say, huh, you know, you said this, but my research kind of showed that. What do you think? And present it not in a confrontational way, but as a question. I almost always, when I'm dealing with tough conversations, ask a lot of questions. Because then hopefully you lead them around to seeing the perspective that your market research or customer research has shown maybe isn't the right place to be. Does that help? Because you guys deal with this all the time, I assume, right? Hippos, anybody heard the expression hippo? Oh, yeah. Highly important person's opinion. Or highest right? paid person's opinion. So <laughs> highest, highest paid, paid person, I've heard that too. I go highly important person's opinion. Yes. But yes, same idea. Right? Yeah. The hippo in the room can lead a discussion way off course. And that's what always we go, that's really interesting. I'm going to go do some research on that. Don't be ever confrontational when those ideas come up in that meeting. And then go do your homework. Right? Okay? So. Span of requirements. Again, product management is about the who and the why. All right? That's where product manager's sweet spot is. Product owner is about the what and the how. And of course, there's overlap and there's loops here, too. I have a different version of the slide, actually, that shows a little loop here. Because you're going to interface here. The product manager and the product owner are going to have discussions about this stuff. Hey. Tell me why we really need this niche. Oh, well, because I did these five interviews, and I've got this research, and look what Gartner is telling me, or the IDC is telling me, over on the who and the why. Okay? The product owner may come back and say, we really think these features are going to deliver on that. And the product manager then has a conversation, huh, interesting, I don't see this particular need being met by those features. How are we going to do that? Right? And that's where you can make this a really productive conversation, a productive relationship. Rather than the discussion I was talking about earlier, where it's kind of like, I think you're wrong, right? Bless you. Not, not a, a productive conversation. But if you stay in your center of gravity for each of the roles and just always are being curious and always talking to each other, then you can create a great productive relationship. Getting that mix between making sure the needs are being delivered, the needs are being met by this set of features, infrastructure, and technology. That's your ultimate goal in this relationship. That makes sense? And if you're the, the, the same person, then you just have a conversation in your head. Okay? But, but do it explicitly, all right? And, and, and I was kind of joking, right? But I do mean this. Explicitly, if you're both product manager and product owner, try to actively move into that role for a minute and look at this just from the product manager's perspective. Am I meeting needs? Or am I just throwing features on a paper? From a product owner's perspective, am I delivering the most value I possibly can to meet those needs? And so you do actually have to kind of ask yourself those questions from both perspectives. All right? So for those of you who are in the same role, doing both things. Make sense? Okay? You got to handle the whole slide and build that way. All right. So what kind of products do you manage or own? So this is a couple of slides to help you figure out whether the PMPO role should be separate or can be together. All right, so if you're in a situation where you're mostly dealing with internal stuff and your constituents are all inside the same building, the virtual building of your business, right? Okay, so then in those circumstances, you're on an internal product. You could be in a supporting product role, which is somewhere in between, and then you've got this commercial. We're generating revenue. We have end users that are outside of our virtual four walls, right? That's the perspective of a market view. All right, so that's one dimension to take into account. Then the other one is the degree of scope for the product. Are you just down at a sub-product level or a product or all the way up at a portfolio level? So that's the technology view versus the business view. So when you put these two together, this is where then you've got this constituent view versus market view at the bottom. 
and you've got this technology view versus business view at the top. And what we say is the, the top row, that's all you should have separate roles because that product management has got to be taken care of, of all of those perspectives. The bottom row, yeah, probably a product manager, product owner, dual role would be acceptable because now you're down at the sub-product level and especially all the way down in the lower left, right? Where you're internal, like an IT department, right? And you're working on a sub-product, sure, that's fine. Product manager, product owner, can, can that whole slide of overlap is your, is your baby, okay? Up and to the right, the more up and to the right you go, and the more up you go, the more you want to separate those roles. Does that help? See what I'm talking about here? So that kind of can help you have those conversations about whether or not it's time to split the role, okay? Or whether it's acceptable to have the role just be split by one person. Especially in a smaller of the company, the, the more difficult it is to justify splitting the role, but if it's a small company delivering B to C, you're going to get, as you grow, that need for separation faster. All right? So if you're a small company, B to C, you're going to want to get the product manager, product owner split sooner. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And then this is the question of like, okay, the, where the red check marks is, is where it's probably okay to have the roles combined. And where there's no red check marks, probably good to have the roles separated. So when you're looking back at these slides, and you get them after product camp, that'll help you remember that. Okay? Ultimate goal is that you become a strategic product leader and not a product janitor. All right? And product janitors are folks that just get everything thrown on their plate and don't find the ability to get help from all the different constituencies that they need to have help from. For example, UX team, right? I did that once, that was a big mistake. Okay? And not getting help from sales, not getting help from marketing, not getting help from customer support, all right? So there's only one of you, whether you're the PM or the PO, figure out what role you really should be playing, and then play that role well. And when people are asking you to do stuff that isn't part of your role, say, hey, you know, I'm a helpful person. Product managers typically are pretty helpful ones. Right? But I'm a helpful person. I would love to help you out. But if I help you with this, then I can't go do voice of the customer work or market research, or competitive analysis. And don't you want me doing that? Okay. And if you need to, enlist your manager's aid in this conversation. Because there's lots of people who want to put everything on the product manager's plate. And you got to get some of them off the plate so you can do the business side of your, of your work and really understand those needs so that the product owner can do their job to deliver that value. Make sense? All right. Questions? Good conversation, I think. I hope we answered most of your questions. All right, so now a couple of shameless plug slides. <laughs> One actually is for you. If you haven't already, go to this URL and you can sign up. Later this afternoon, we're going to be giving away three different products from the 280 group. The top one is a full on online course on product management. So you'll get the entire soup to nuts understanding of product management, and it ends with the ability to take the certified product manager exam from AITMM. All right. Then we also have got a product management office professional, which is a whole suite of templates and tools so that you get a head start on asking the right questions when you're thinking about a business case, when you're thinking about doing market research, when you're thinking about a voice of the customer work. All of these templates and tools have all those questions embedded in them and help you answer the right questions. All right, and then lastly, a copy of Product Management for Dummies, a book that our, our company published last year. So we'll be giving those away later on today. And thank you very much for your attention. And if you wouldn't mind, go to this URL and fill out the survey so that we can get your feedback on whether this was helpful or not. We've got a couple minutes left over, so I'll just turn it over and we can have an open discussion. Thanks for your attention.